No. They wanted to just check it out. That's what we're doing. Are they, are they going to be Where's my wife? Good morning. Let's all stand. Guys, having some good fellowship? (laughs) We're going to be spending eternity fellowshipping with one another, so this is a taste. Can you imagine we'll be fellowshipping and there won't even be a single word of, oh, man, I got this ache, I got this, those kind of conversations won't even take place anymore. (laughs) Amen. (laughs) Amen. Let's worship. something about this Christian experience that's 
it's, it seems like there's something always lacking. You're always calling us deeper. No matter where we're at in our relationship with you, we feel this call, this sense to go deeper with you, Father, to know more about you, to experience you, Father, in just a, a more perfect way. And Lord, I think that's a prayer and a desire you always answer, you always minister to, Lord. And so we thank you that you put that in our hearts. Now, Lord, we just want to pray for the service this morning and for all the other churches, Lord. Calvary Chapel Lincoln, Calvary Chapel Sandpoint, Calvary Chapel Midway, Calvary Chapel New Life, Calvary Chapel Quincy, Calvary Chapel, Lord, over there all the way uh, in New Zealand, Lord, and over in Placerville with Jeff, and just all the ones we're associated with. We lift their churches before you this morning as well. And God, we just ask that your Holy Spirit would speak to us this morning during our time of worship and during our time of the study of your word. And so, Father, help us to let go of everything and just for the next little while tune our ears in, Father, to you. We pray in the mighty name of Jesus and all God's sons and daughters would say with a loud voice, Amen. Amen. Hey, let's remain standing this morning.
Lord, we want to serve no one but you with all of our hearts, Lord. That's our cry in Jesus' name. Amen. You may be seated. Oh, to grace, how great. 
Father, we know that only the Holy Spirit can make the truth of that song real in our hearts. And the first process of that is bringing us to the end of ourselves that we know that there's nothing good in us. We confess that this morning, Lord. We've all sinned and fallen short of the glory and the holy standard of a holy God. And we are broken this morning because of that. But Lord, we give you glory that because of your grace and the willingness of your son to leave that position in heaven, the second person of the Godhead, the eternal word, God coming in human form and and suffering and dying for our sins on Calvary's cross, that we might be forgiven, we can be brought back into fellowship with you, Lord. We can become what you designed us to be, those who bring pleasure to you, Father, and in that process, something happens in us so deep, so rich, and so real that we're made whole again, Father. And we thank you for that this morning. Uh, We know that it is finished. We know that you paid the price for our sins. We know this morning that we have been ransomed and rescued. And we thank you for that this morning. You know, 43 years as a believer, I've never lost the absolute amazement of that fact. That you love me, that you called me, that you rescued me, that you paid for all of my sins. Thank you, Father. Now, Lord, for the many needs represented in our fellowship, we still have those out there still sick, Lord, from the thing going through our community, we lift them before you. We have many traveling. We want to pray for Jim. His, he's down ministering at a funeral this weekend. One of his high school buddies, I think his sister, passed away. A good friend of his as well. We pray that you would use him, Father. Uh, pray for Gary and Gail as they're still out and about on some cruise between Australia and New Zealand, Lord. Just, you know, keep them safe. Keep Pastor Tim and Leanne safe as they're traveling up through Montana. And then just so many others, Lord, that aren't here this morning for whatever reason. We pray that as they're watching by live stream or attending some other church, you would just bless them and encourage them and strengthen them. Thank you, Father, for the work of your spirit already this morning. We could take the rest of the service and people could just give testimony to what you have said. But we want to study your word and see what you've put down for us to understand as well. So thank you, Father, this morning for your goodness for your blessing, for your willingness to come and fellowship with us. And we thank you in Jesus' name. And all God's kids that say, Amen.
Amen. Well, you know the drill. Let's take a few moments and greet one another before we settle into our spots. I'm going to have to, huh? All right. If you guys can find your spots this morning, we'll get moving. Okay. Okay. All right. Come in and find your spot. <laughs> Oh, isn't it nice to have come through a busy season? We made it through Passion Week. We put on the play, the presentation. Kind of nice to take a deep breath before we start preparing for Christmas. Amen? <laughs> and so, that said, I only have two announcements this morning. Uh, number one, don't forget that the couples retreat is going to come up real quick. May the 18th, 19th, and 20th, we're going to be up at Zephyr Cove, right on Lake Tahoe, beautiful setting. i going to be some excellent teaching, some great fellowship. There's going to be some free time so you can kind of scout out South Lake Tahoe. And I only got to say one thing, uh, whatever you win in gambling is 20% tithe. <laughs> so, not that you guys would have that problem. Uh, but all of the money... <laughs> All of the money has to be in uh, for the retreat. It's $350 per couple by uh, April the 30th. And you can see Georgia um, because Gail's out of town until she gets back to see Georgia about that, would you? Secondly, and maybe uh, some of you have been, and I know over the years been asking me about this, but we're planning a trip to Israel uh, somewhere around November, December. We're working with Jay McCarl. He's going to be our guide we're probably going to be going with Calvary Chapel Lincoln and Calvary Chapel of the Foothills out of Shingle Springs. Pastor Jeff Martin, uh, Todd Gold, who's part of our staff here as well, uh, in our three churches. Uh, so you need to be saving ahead. It's going to be between $3,500 and $4,000. We'll nail down the price per person. So we're giving you plenty of a warning and uh, you know, plenty of advanced knowledge so that you can be saving up for that. It'll be a wonderful time. Now, here's the deal. Don't be disappointed 
if the rapture happens before we get there. Because we get to see the new and revised, remodeled Jerusalem. So, well, we're going to plan on going to see the old one uh, if Jesus tarries. So put that down on your list of things to save your money for. Amen? Hey, let's turn our Bibles again now to the book of Acts. We've come as far as chapter 10, verse 16. Put your finger there on verse 16 and let's pray. Father, we thank you. We've come to a very interesting section of Scripture. We've come to the place where the Gentiles are brought into the faith, brought into the church. And Lord, you have been preparing this moment in Peter's heart to be the one. We know that he won't continue to be the one. He's not called to be the apostle uh, to the Gentiles. We know that Paul is, and he will pick that up in the next chapter, that calling. But for your purposes and for your reasons, you're going to use Peter to be the first to see the outpouring of the Holy Spirit upon the Gentiles. And that has great significance for us this morning because we're Gentiles. And this is the place where we come in uh, to the church and have the Gentile Pentecost, as it were, And so, Lord, just as we look at these things, may we be ever thankful that your grace is sufficient, that your mercies are new every morning, and that, Lord, not by any work of righteousness which we could perform or ever would be able to perform, but you saved us and you washed us and you regenerated us in the Holy Ghost as we're going to see this morning and we thank you for that in Jesus' name. Amen. You know, one of the things that kind of just comes to the fore as we're looking at this area of Scripture, these passages leading up to chapter 10, on through chapter 10, into chapter 11, is how God orders things. Isn't it interesting that Peter being there in Jerusalem with with the mother church is led now by the Holy Spirit to go down uh, and check on the churches. He ends up in Joppa at Simon the Tanner's house. I find that interesting because God is preparing him to be the one who goes first of all and foremost to the Gentiles that allows the Holy Spirit to fall upon them. And, you know, he goes down there and he raises this lady from the dead. And in doing that, I think God is speaking to him that I'm about to take something that is dead, the Gentile world. Because you remember, as far as the Jews were concerned, every Gentile was outside of the covenants and promises of God. They were in this world without Christ and no hope. And so they were as good as dead. And in the Jewish mindset, Gentiles were only good to feed the fires of hell. They were considered to be unclean. They were considered to be the offscouring of the world. They were considered to be so dead that God couldn't redeem them unless they first converted to Judaism and became a Jew as a convert, and then God would tolerate them. Kind of a second-rate kind of a thing, but they could be in. But God is about to do something so fantastic, so remarkable, so beyond comprehension in the mind of any Jewish person, especially in the heart and mind of Peter, that he has to prepare him for this. He has to take Peter from Jerusalem. He has to take him down there to Joppa. There he raises a woman from the dead, and no doubt God is speaking to Peter that I can raise the dead. And then he lodges at this man Simon the Tanner's house. Now this is interesting because a tanner was considered to be unclean even though he was a Jewish person. Even in Judaism, he was considered to be unclean. His place of business had to be at least 75 feet outside of town, the city limits. It had to be downwind. In fact, if you were a tanner and you married and took a wife and you didn't tell her that you were a tanner ahead of time, that was grounds for divorce. You were ceremonially unclean, and there 
Simon Peter is in Simon the Tanner's house, and no doubt as he is lodging there, he sees these wineskins just covering the walls as this tanner, because the primary function for a tanner is to make vessels that carry wine and water. And maybe Peter is reminded what Jesus said, you cannot put new wine in an old skin. Something new, something remarkable is going to happen. Something so new, so remarkable, God said, if I'd have told you in advance, you'd have never believed it. Now in Abraham's covenant, you go back to Genesis chapter 12, we know that part of the blessing that was to come upon Abraham is that he was to be a light to all nations, and because of that, even the Gentile nations would be blessed. You can read it again in chapter 18. God's plan was always that the Jewish nation, his people, would be such a light to the world that they would draw people into relationship with God. Now they failed in that mission at first. But now the church is going to be that that draws people in. The first part of the church were Gentile converts. They were completed in Christ. They received Christ as the Messiah. And as we come to the text before us this morning, we're going to see now that the Gentiles are coming in. But God is preparing. And this is the first point I want you to make as you get your pad and pen out. Listen, God is directing your path, even when you don't see it or understand it. You need to be acutely aware of that. The steps of a righteous man or woman are ordered of the Lord. There are things going on in your life right now, places you're going, things you're seeing, uh, understanding God is trying to give you that you may not know for way down the road. In fact, Peter's going to ponder some of these things. They're a little confusing to him. But nonetheless, God is directing his path. God is leading him. God is guiding him. God is working in the heart of Peter. God has Peter right where he wants him. God is speaking the things into Peter's life that are so profound, he's having a hard time, first of all, wrapping his hands around them, but but slowly, bit by bit, God is going to communicate his will to Peter, and I think that's how he works in our lives. Amen? So we read there in verse 16, These things were done three times, and the vessel was received up again into heaven. If you remember the last time we were here in the first part of chapter 10, that Peter gets hungry. He's there at Simon the Tanner's house. He goes up on the roof, which was the patio. He takes a little nap while he's waiting for lunch to be made. He has this vision. He sees the sheep gathered up at four corners. It's let down from heaven. And as it unfolds before him, there's every creeping and crawly thing, every unclean and foul thing there gathered up in the sheet. And by the way, that represents you and me. That's the church. Uh, Every creepy, crawly, every foul thing. Because that's what we were before Jesus saying this. Amen? Hey, don't live under delusion. Jesus didn't save you because you were good. He tells them in the Old Testament, Israel, I didn't save you because you were better than any other people or you were more than number or there was anything special about you. I saved you because I love you. And listen, that's still an incredible thing to me after 43 years of serving the Lord that he would love me. But he didn't save me because I was the tallest, obviously. He didn't save me because I was the handsomest, obviously. But God saved me the same way and the same reason he saved you. Because God loves you. Now for me, that's a marvel. I could give him, and I do, a lot of reasons not to. But I thank God that he doesn't work on being loving. I thank God that John tells us God is love. That's who he is. And he saved us. And he washed us and he redeemed us. So this sheet is let down and what Peter is seeing is you and me. And the Lord says to Peter, kill and eat. And Peter says, not so, Lord. How many times have you said that? Don't raise your hand. That's an oxymoron. It can't, two things that can't go together. You can never say, you can say not so and you should to certain things. And you should say Lord to other things, but you can't put those two things together. 
You can never say and be in obedience to the Lord, not so, Lord, but Peter does. Peter says, I've never eaten anything that's unclean. I've never participated in any of that, Lord. Listen, I'm a good Jewish kosher man. Wouldn't do it. And then the Lord said to him, and he has to say to him three times. Isn't it interesting that Peter learns in threes? So listen, if, if you fail and you're failing again, and maybe you're lapping the mountain for the third time, hey, listen, take heart this morning. Peter learned in threes. You remember that the Lord had to wake him up three times in the Garden of Gethsemane when they were praying. Three times, the Bible says, that Peter denied the Lord when he was arrested. After the resurrection, Jesus comes to Peter and has to ask him three times, do you love me? And now three times, the Lord has to say to Peter, listen very carefully, and this is our point this morning, and it's a profound one, don't you call unclean what I have cleansed. And listen, neither do you have the right. Because sometimes we as Christians can become very judgmental, very critical. We can become, as we walk with the Lord for a little ways and some of the old stuff falls off, we, we can become critical of people that still have the same stuff we used to have. And if we're not careful, we begin to see the sin in other people's lives worse than the sin in our own life. You know, I've often thought about that story of the prodigal son. And they'll probably put it up, Luke chapter 15, verses 20 through uh, 32. I don't want to read it all, but I'm going to give you commentary. You can read it as I'm kind of giving you commentary. But I find it interesting that in most Bibles, when you look at the top, as you're looking through the different things the chapters cover in the Gospels, it says there the story of the prodigal son. That's what it says in my Bible. Probably is what it says in your Bible. But I don't think it was the story of the prodigal son. I think it's more of the story of the judgmental brother. Because who of us haven't been the prodigal son? And by the way, the church, I think that this, this, this can be applied to the church, that we were, as Gentiles, the prodigal son. We had wasted our lives on riotous living. Can anybody say amen to that? And we were so far away from the Father, but He kept seeing us. We, we, weren't, we, weren't, we weren't beyond His view, but we were out in the world. We were outside of the covenants and promises of God. We were in this world without any hope, without Christ. But yet the Father was watching and waiting for that day, as we're going to see this morning in chapter 10, when the prodigal would come home. And when the prodigal comes home, the Bible says that the Father went out and embraced him for two reasons. First of all, to show him that he loved him. But secondly, to protect him from any consequence to his sin because it would have been the right of one of the neighbors to come and accuse that son of being rebellious with their parents and be stoned to death then he says you get a robe you put it on him put new shoes on his feet put a ring on his finger because my son that was lost is now found go kill the fatted uh, calf and we're going to have a party tonight and so as they're praising God, and as they're parting for the one that was lost who comes home, here comes the brother. And when the brother gets close, he hears this, this music, and so he asks one of the servants, what is that? He goes, hey, your brother, your brother who was lost has come home, and your dad's throwing a party for him. And the Bible says that that brother became angry. And then he goes to the father, and he says something like this, hey, dad, why are you throwing a party for that scoundrel? I stayed here and I worked hard and I was faithful and I never left you. You were, you were my father and I was your son and you never threw me a party. But that scoundrel comes back home still smelling like the world, still having the slop of pigs running down his garment, that filthy guy. He comes home and you throw him a party? I love what the father says. Isn't it right? Isn't it fitting that we should rejoice because your brother who was lost is found? One of the underlying themes of the rest of this chapter is God's going to have to break prejudice in Peter and every other Jew because God is about to bring in 
the unclean Gentiles to faith. And he's going to do it by grace, not by the keeping of the law. And God has to remind Peter three times what I call clean, what I have cleansed, you do not have the right to call unclean. And I will tell you this morning, if you're a recipient of God's grace, if you have come to faith in Jesus Christ, if you bowed your knee to the Lordship of Jesus Christ, if you have been regenerated in the Holy Spirit and washed in the water of the Word, if you have been born again, then you are cleansed and you are clean. And no man has the right to call you unclean. The Bible says that you are without excuse, whoever you are who judges another man's servant. God didn't call us to do that. Because before his Lord, he stands and falls, and yea, the Lord is even able to make him to stand. As we've been going through Hebrews on Wednesday nights, we've been learning some really interesting things. In fact, I want to take you through a few of those verses uh, as we uh, kind of pass on now through the rest of chapter 10. In Hebrews chapter 1, verse 3, if you had been here on Wednesday nights, you would have already heard this, but some of you aren't, so we'll say it again. That there in the opening verses is God is now elevating Jesus above the angels, above Moses, above Joshua, above the law, above the Levitical priesthood, above Aaron, that Jesus is superior to all of these things because he's the Lamb of God who doesn't just atone for the sins but takes them away. We read there in chapter 1, verse 3, who being in the brightness of his glory, the expressed image of his person, upholding all things by the word of his power, when he had by himself... Those are words you want to underline in your Bible. Purged our sins. Catharizeo is the Greek word for there. We get catharized from that. He means he bled all of the poison out of you. He by himself cleansed you of all of your sins. And then he sat down at the right hand of the Father waiting till his enemies should be made his footstool. Why? Because the work is done. It's finished. Jesus paid the price. And then when we move into, as we had, Hebrews chapter 8, verse 12, it says, for I will be merciful. Aren't you glad God's that way? I will be merciful to their unrighteousness. Now listen, did any of you commit any sins this way? Just Mike, just Randy, just, just a few of you. No, not all of us. You know, some of us are just like Carl, perfect. <laughs> just doesn't need the grace and mercy like we do. But God is saying, I will be merciful to their unrighteousness and to their sins and to their iniquities. I will remember no more. Not only has he cleansed you, but your sins, past, present, and future, he says, I'm not even going to remember. That's how clean you are. Thoroughly, completely. And then in Hebrews chapter 10, and we came there last Wednesday night, and it says this, starting at verse 10, by the which will we are sanctified through the offering of the body of Jesus Christ once and for how long? All. Oh, I like that word all there. For every priest standeth daily ministering and offering oft times the same sacrifice, which can never take away sins. But this man, get this, after he'd offered one sacrifice for sins, how long? Forever. Then he sat down at the right hand of God, henceforth expecting his enemies to made his footstools. And listen to the next verse. Verse 14 is very important. For by one offering, he hath perfected forever them that are sanctified. That word means to be made holy and to be set apart, and that's what you are. Now, how did that happen? Romans 10, 13. For whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. God is having to prepare Peter's heart for this moment. It's going to be shocking to him. So he sends him to Lydda where he heals a paralytic. The reputation and the fame of that healing goes up to Joppa. A lady there of renown has passed away, Tabitha. They send now word to Peter, come quickly. Peter goes up to Joppa there and he raises her from the dead. 
God's speaking deep things, profound things in the heart of Peter. Peter is there in Simon the Tanner's house. He's seeing the wineskins. No doubt God is speaking to him about you can't pour new wine in an old skin. The law is fading away. Something new is coming to the fore. It's called grace. And as he's hungry, maybe even hangry, he's on the roof. He falls asleep. He enters into a trance. He has this vision, these four sheets coming down, all of these squiggly, wiggly, you know, foul things are there. The Lord says, kill and eat. He says, not so, Lord. The Lord three times has to say to Peter, don't you call unclean what I have cleansed. And then we see that the sheet was taken up and received again into heaven. Verse 17 says, now while Peter doubted, I, I mean, he doesn't understand what this thing is. He's trying to figure it out. Why he's doubting and wondering in himself what this vision which he had had seen uh, should mean. What does this mean? Behold, the men which were sent from Cornelius had made inquiry of Simon's house and they stood at the gate. Watch God's timing. Earlier, God had spoken to Cornelius. You know, go 35 miles north, send your servants to Caesarea and seek one Simon of Peter, and when he comes, he will tell you the things that you've been praying about. He will give you the complete understanding of what is necessary. So God has already orchestrated that. Now he has, you know, Simon and Peter have this vision, and while he's pondering what these things might possibly mean, these men show up at the door. And they called, verse 18 says, and asked whether Simon which was surnamed Peter, was lodged there. And while Peter thought on the vision, while he's still trying to figure these things out, how many of you, you know, the Lord is speaking to you, and you're trying to figure it out. What are you saying? While he's still there, because I think he's like us a little dense, the Lord said, okay, Holy Spirit, just talk to him. Because he's not going to get it on his own. The Spirit said... I like what A.W. Tozer says about the book of Acts. He says, if you take the work of the Holy Spirit out of the book of Acts, 90% of what we see happening would have never happened. The Holy Spirit is active in this first century church, speaking and directing, leading and guiding, empowering. And listen, the same Spirit is with us. Did you feel it this morning? Did you sense it? He's still trying to talk to his people. My Bible says that Jesus said, my sheep hear my voice and they follow no other. While Peter's trying to figure this out, the Spirit said unto him, behold, three men seek thee. Didn't tell them they were Gentiles. That probably would have freaked Peter out. But there are three men that are seeking thee. We know that when Cornelius sent them two servants that were Gentiles and one Roman soldier. Three men seek thee. Arise therefore, watch what he says, and get thee down and go with them doubting nothing. So many times God gives us direction and what is the first thing we do? Yeah. I'm glad the Holy Spirit says, and don't doubt doubting nothing. Why? For I have sent them. They're my messengers. I've sent them. Then Peter went down to the men which were there sent by Cornelius and said, Behold, I am whom you seek. What is the cause wherefore ye are come? And they said, listen, Cornelius, a centurion. Don't you know that Peter is short-circuiting right now? Uh, He looks out there by the door and there's two Gentiles, no doubt he can tell them, and a Roman soldier. And he asked, why are you here? Why are you seeking me? And they said, well, Cornelius, a centurion. Not only is he a Roman soldier, but he's over a hundred Roman soldiers. He holds a position in the Roman army. We found out earlier he's of the Italian band, which was the very loyalists to Caesar and to Rome. A very elite group. He was part of what we would call the special ops. I mean, he's part of what we would call the SEAL team. A centurion uh, whom, listen, what, what he says here, Cornelius, uh, where am I at? What verse would I end at? 23. 23. I'm glad you guys are paying attention. Did I turn the page? 
22. Oh, yes, here we are, 22. And he said, Cornelius the centurion, a just man, and one that feareth God, and of good report among all nations of the Jews, was warned from God by a holy angel to sin for thee into his house and to hear the words from thee. Now you know Peter short circuiting. What? A Gentile, a Roman gen a Roman soldier, a Roman centurion Gentile who is a just man, one who fears the Lord, one who's of good report among the nation of the Jews, no doubt because he helped build the synagogue there in Caesarea. Historians tell us. He was warned of God? You mean God would actually warn a Gentile? Our concept was that they were just fodder for the fires of hell. But now you're telling me that God warned him? And not only did God warn him, but he sent a holy angel to warn him and to send for you, Peter, that you would come and tell him the things that he needs to do. Amazing. And verse 23 is the pivotal point here. Verse 23 of chapter 10 of Acts is a very pivotal point in the life of the church. Peter's getting it. Watch what happens here. Verse 23 says, Then he called uh, he them in. He's inviting these Gentiles into a home of a Jew. And he lodged them. That is an interesting term. It means not only did he bring them in and give them a place to sleep, he fed them. In fact, he broke bread with them. Now, can you imagine being around that fire in that living room that night when you have Peter, you have a Roman soldier, you have an unclean Jew, a tanner, and you've got two other Gentiles breaking bread and fellowshipping. I wonder what the conversation was like. Peter's beginning to get it. Now, he could have refused. And on the morrow, Peter went away. It says there at the end of verse 23, and, and, and with them, and certain brethren from Joppa accompanied him. Peter's going to take six guys with him. And it's a good thing that he did because when we get to chapter 11, Peter's going to get some heartburn over this. It's the word's going to reach Jerusalem that he entered into a Gentile's house and he's going to be called on the carpet. So he wants as many witnesses as he can about his actions at this time. And verse 24 says, On the morrow after they entered into Caesarea and Cornelius waited for them and had called together his kinsmen and his near friends. Uh, most people tell us there's probably at this time maybe 50 to 100 people gathered in his home. A Roman centurion made 16 times more than an enlisted soldier. That means he probably had a pretty nice house uh, and probably a large living room. And so there's a great multitude gathered. He's brought all of his family and his friends, his in-laws, his outlaws, everybody that needs to be saved are gathered there now and they're waiting for Peter's arrival. Verse 25 says, And as Peter was coming into Cornel uh, in, Cornelius met him and he fell down at his feet and he worshipped him. But Peter took him up saying, Stand up, I myself am a man. Now if you have Catholic background, this might mean something to you. Uh, I think that Peter was trying to stop anything in the future about anybody bowing down to him and kissing his toe. Do you know it? Uh, there's a place in Rome where they have a statue of Peter where people kiss his toe. I would never do that. First of all, I don't want to get toe main poisoning. <laughs> but secondly, Peter's not the Pope. Peter's a man, and he says that I'm just a man like you. People in ministry ought to remember that. God may call a sheep out of his fold to be an under-shepherd of his sheep, but the best of men are just men. That's all we are. 
pastors included. They're just men called to an extraordinary and difficult ministry. And they need your prayers. They're not to be worshipped. They're not to be bowed down to. You're not to kiss their ring or their toe. They serve and worship the same God that you do. But they are men put in a position of leadership, and I think it was right. I think some of this was cultural because Cornelius was taught as a Roman soldier when a man of greater honor and greater prestige came, like if he would ever to stand before Caesar, Caesar, and no doubt he had, he would bow. But Peter's reminding him, don't bow before men. But there's one that is worthy that you should bow before. And that's the king of glory. And so Peter rises him up in verse 27 it says, and as they talked with him, he went in and he found many that were come together. Verse 28, and he said unto them, you know that it is an unlawful thing. It is an unlawful thing for a man that is a Jew to keep company or to come into one of another nation. Now listen carefully to the next statement because it's a little different than what he's going to say later. It's a little different than what Jesus said. I think it has a different interpretation. I think there's two things going on here. And I think this is extremely important as we're selling our doctrine you know, about soteriology. Here's what Peter says, but God hath shown me. Peter's getting it now. God has shown me that I should not call any man common or unclean. Here's what I think the idea or the interpretation of the last part of verse 28 should be. There's nobody beyond the reach of God by His grace. Now, some won't come, some will refuse, but no man is beyond it. You see, that's why I can never be a Calvinist, because the Calvinists teach that there are people beyond it, and that God has to choose them with a special anointing so that they could receive because we're so totally depraved we're beyond the grace of God. That's not what the Bible teaches. And we're going to see later that he ta- teaches about the whosoever. But he's saying to Peter, listen, nobody's beyond my grace. Don't call any man or don't say of any man that they're so far gone that they can't be redeemed. You can travel this world and you can see some pretty down and out people, and I have. But nobody is beyond God's salvation. And don't ever think that. Verse 29 says, Therefore came I unto you without gainsaying, without delay. As soon as I went forth, I ask, therefore, for what intent have you sent for me? And Cornelius said, four days ago, I was fasting until this very hour, till three o'clock in the afternoon. And on the ninth hour, I prayed in my house. And behold, a man stood before me in bright clothing. The idea for bright there means glistening in the Greek. It's glistening. There's, there's something profoundly, the light refracting from him is glistening. And he said, Cornelius, and listen very carefully to verse 31. This is important. Cornelius, thy prayer, thy prayer is heard, and thy alms have come up as a memorial in remembrance. The idea is in the sight of God. Now, when we go back to verse 2 of chapter 10, here's what it says, a devout man, one who feared God uh, with all of his house, who gave alms to the people and who prayed always. He, he had this pattern of just praying. But that's not what it's talking about. Uh, the Greek construct here, the, uh, the way that it's laid out is he's talking about a particular prayer. Not just general prayer. How many have general prayers? You know, you go to prayer and you're praying about everything. Uh, some of you even pray about your dog. I've had people ask me in this congregation, did my dog, when it died, go to heaven? And I say, yes. I saw the movie. <laughs> All dogs go to heaven. I don't know. <laughs> but you have prayers, general prayers. But I'll tell you, there is a recurring prayer in my heart. It's my life prayer. My life prayer 
my heart's passion is, Lord, that I might know you. I want to know you. And the knowledge I have of you and the relationship I have with you today, I know won't satisfy me tomorrow. I want to go deeper. Lord, reveal yourself to me. And no doubt Cornelius, this Roman centurion, this man who feared God, this man who had cast away the pantheon of Roman gods and had settled upon the true and living God. No doubt Philip, as he's in Caesarea, after leading the Ethiopian eunuch to the Lord and baptizing, had some influence in that community. And this man had heard that gospel message and had accepted it. But in that prayer, what is the next step? What, I, there's something burning in me. There's something cooking in me. There's something that's, that's not satisfied, that's not settled in me. Lord, I want to know you. I want to know you deeper. What is the next step? What is the next process? There's something lacking. There's something unfulfilled. There's something I know that's more. What is it? And no doubt, as Cornelius fasted and prayed, that was the reoccurring prayer, not the general prayers. Lord, I long for something more. There's got to be something more. I sense in my spirit or something more. Lord, take me deeper. Father, just whatever it is, I need to know what it is. I think God heard his prayer when Peter was still in Jerusalem and set this whole series of events up to answer Cornelius' prayer. Just like in Daniel. When finally Gabriel gets to Daniel, he said, Daniel, the day you begin to pray, I was dispatched 21 days ago. But I found some resistance with the prince of the power of Persia, the prince of the air. But I'm here now to tell you what it is God wants to tell you. Don't lose heart when you're praying. And maybe when your heart is saying, Lord, I want to go deeper. Lord, there are things in my life that you need to remove. There's things that are hindering me. There's things cooking in me that shouldn't be there. There's things in my heart, Lord, that break my heart. And I'm praying for a deeper walk with you. I think that's what he's praying for. Because the answer will be, you need to be born again. And he will be before this uh, section is over. So let's watch. So as Cornelius said, thy prayer is heard, and thy alms has come as a remembrance in, in, in the sight of God. Send therefore to Joppa, call hither Simon, whose surname is Peter. He lodges there at the house of Simon the tanner by the seaside, whom when he comes he shall speak unto thee. He's going to tell you what is necessary. Now you think God doesn't know where you're at? Watch what the angel tells Cornelius. Now you go to Caesarea. You go to one Simon the Tanner's house. It's by the seaside. And there you will find Simon Peter. So don't ever think God doesn't know where you're at. And when he comes, he'll tell you what is necessary. He'll tell you what the next step is. He'll tell you what your heart is longing for. Verse 33 says, Immediately therefore I send to thee and thou hast well done that thou hast come. Now therefore are we all here present before God. They had a sense that God was doing something. Just like we had this morning when we were worshiping. We're all here before God to hear all things that are commanded thee of God. I want to know what is the next step. Then Peter opened his mouth and said, of a truth, I perceive that God is no respecter of persons. Now, Paul will pick up on this and he'll use this phrase three times in his writing when he becomes the apostle of grace. He will mention it in Romans chapter 2 verse 11. He'll mention it in Galatians chapter 2 verse 6 and again in Ephesians chapter 6 verse 9 as he sent to the Gentiles because God is not a respecter of persons. He loves all equally. He's capable of saving all equally. And that's why I say to you, listen, there's no room in the kingdom of heaven for prejudice. Yellow, black, or white, they're all precious in His sight. No one's beyond His grace to redeem. The foulest of men can be saved. 
Look around. You're the creepy crawly things let down in the sheet. Then Peter opened his mouth and said, man, I have a truth. I perceive, now I'm getting it, that God is no respecter of persons, but in every nation he hath them that fear him and worketh righteousness and is accepted to him. The word which God sent unto the children of Israel preaching peace by Jesus Christ, that we could be brought back into fellowship with God, that God could remove our sins and we could have peace with God because He is Lord of all. That's the message. And then now Peter is going to preach the gospel in its simplicity. Watch as he walks his way through this. The word I say you know, you've heard of it. This thing wasn't done in secret. The crucifixion, the burial, and resurrection of Jesus Christ has resounded through the whole Roman Empire. This was not done in secret. You've heard about it. Uh, All Judea, which began in the Galilee after the baptism of John, preached how God anointed Jesus of Nazareth with the Holy Ghost and with power, who went about doing good and healing all who were oppressed of devils, for God was with him. And, w- and we are witnesses of all the things which he both have done in the land of the Jews and in Jerusalem, whom they slew and they hanged on a tree. We are witnesses that he was God incarnate. He proved it As Isaiah 35 would say, when the Messiah comes, he will do all of these miracles. We are witnesses of that. And him they hanged on a tree. Cursed is everyone who hangs on a tree. Him God raised up the third day and showed him openly, not to all the people, but unto witnesses chosen before by God, even to us who did eat and drink with him who rose from the dead. Some 40 days Jesus was walking around eating and drinking and teaching his disciples, giving them further insight into the gospel. And watch verse 42, and he commanded us to preach unto the people and to testify that he is, that it is he which was ordained of God to be the judge of the living and the dead. Make no mistake, part of the preaching of the gospel of the good news is that there's a judgment day coming. See, it wouldn't be good news if it didn't rescue from something. Make no mistake, there's a judgment day coming for the Christian and for the unbeliever. For you and I, the beam of seat judgment not for our sins, but for how we spent the resources God gave us. You see, your life has resources to it. Your time, your talent, your energy, your finances, every good gift that you have comes from the Father of lights and whom there is no variance or shadow of turning. Everything you are, everything that you ever hope to be, everything that has come your way has come to you from Him. It's your talents. And how you spend those resources here in this life will determine your dividends on the other side. You and I are going to stand before the Lord someday and He's going to say, okay, I gave you five talents. What did you do with it? I gave you two. I gave you one. What did you do with it? And we're going to be rewarded. That's what the Bible says. All of the things that we built our life upon, the the, the silver, the gold, the precious stones, the wood, hay, and stubble are going to be tested by fire. And only that which remains will be our reward. And it says that some Christians are going to lose everything because although they were saved, they lived their lives for themselves. And all is gone. No reward, but they're in heaven. And some, much reward because God will be a debtor to no man. But the second and more terrifying one is the great white throne of judgment when one day men will stand before God, not clothed in a garment that Jesus purchased for them, and they're going to give an account for their sins. The Bible says it's a fearful thing to fall into the hands of the living God. Peter is saying that God commissioned us and commanded us to go into all the world and to preach this gospel. And part of the preaching of this gospel is a judgment day coming. And you need to be ready for that day. 
And secondly, he goes on to mention, not only is there a judgment day coming, verse 43 says, to him give all the prophets witness. 300 prophecies concerning Jesus fulfilled in his life. To him give all the prophets witness that through his name, now get this, whosoever, doesn't matter where you slept or who you slept with. It doesn't matter what you've inhaled in your lungs or injected in your veins or snorted up your nose or guzzled down your throat. It doesn't matter what you did or who you did it to. You are redeemable. Because you're a whosoever. Are you a whosoever? I'm a whosoever. Guess what? We are whosoever's. Whosoever believeth. It doesn't say work or earn. It says believe. And the ETH, I like it, the old King James, that means believe and keep on believing. Believe in Him, in Jesus, and what Jesus did shall receive remission of sins, the removal of sins. We just went through that in Hebrews. He purged your sins by Himself. Your sins and your iniquities He remembers no more. By one sacrifice He has perfected forever those that come to Him. That's who we are in Christ. And so before pa- Peter can get to, you know, every good pastor, every good preacher, man, they have all the points they want to make. Like today, you're going, man, come on, just hurry up. But we got, man, we have studied all week. We got, we, got, we got this message. We're going to deliver whether you like it or not. I'm sure Peter had it all planned. Now, he's preached the gospel. He's talking about justification. I'm sure he wants to go into sanctification. Talk about how you ought to live. But I think the Holy Spirit is going to make a point here. We're almost done with our study this morning. He's going to interrupt Peter. And he's just going to interrupt Peter in such a powerful way. Uh, Because Peter, all they need to know is that Jesus is enough. That Jesus and Jesus only saves. That whosoever believeth in him, listen, their sins are forgiven. They have age-abiding life. Uh, The other part of that is a response. And every Christian should have that response. But that response doesn't save you. Jesus saves you. And so the Holy Spirit just interrupts him. Watch what he does here in verse 44. And while Peter was yet speaking, man, he's getting ahead of steam up like most pastors and preachers. Man, we're right to the very, I'm getting right to the point, man. And, and I got all of these analogies. I got all of these stories I want to tell, man. I got all this application that I want to give you. The Holy Spirit just interrupts Peter right in mid-sentence, as it were, and fell on all of them which heard the word. Faith cometh by hearing, and the hearing of the word of God. And they that were circumcised, which believed, were astonished as many as came with Peter, because on the Gentiles also was poured out this gift of the Holy Spirit. How did they see it? They're going to tell us in a few moments, because it was the same thing that happened on the day of Pentecost to the Jews. No doubt fire leaping from their heads. No doubt the sound of a rushing mighty wind. No doubt them speaking in tongues and praising, glorifying God. He's going to tell us about that. Now the reason these Jews are astonished, it wasn't because they didn't think a Gentile could be saved. But they thought a Gentile had to be converted to Judaism and then be saved. But God is not a respecter of persons. This is new wine that an old skin can't contain. This is God bypassing the covenant with Abraham and honoring a new covenant that Jesus made in his own blood that whosoever would believe in Jesus could be saved and receive the same outpouring of the Holy Spirit. And so their their jaws are on the ground. Peter's looking at that six guys he brought with him. They're looking at Peter going, Yahweh, what is this? And then they say this, For they heard them speak with tongues, and they were magnifying God. Then Peter answered, Can any man forbid water that these should be baptized, which have received the Holy Spirit as well as us just the same way? Can we refrain water baptism from them. Now notice very carefully, maybe you've been around people that believe in baptism or regeneration. 
Didn't happen here. They got saved and then they were baptized. How many got saved and then you were baptized? That's the right order of things. But you were already saved. How do we know that? Because you were filled with the Holy Spirit. You were transformed. You became a new creature in Christ. You were born again. And then they were baptized. And he commanded them to be baptized in the name of the Lord. Then prayed they him to tarry certain days. No doubt Peter stayed there. And he fed them. And he taught them. Now what's interesting is in the next chapter, we'll get there next week, Peter gets in trouble by the religious leaders for this. And he has to recount this whole thing again. Because prejudice can run deep. Here's what I want you to take from this. This is the second point. Prejudice, even in your heart, can run deep. Because sometimes we forget that God rescued us from a pit. We forget what we were like and how sinful we were. And as we walk with the Lord, sometimes we can become very legalistic. And when people walk in the door of the church the same way I walked in 43 years ago, we can have a tendency to judge. He doesn't smell so good. She doesn't smell so good. They don't look so good. Oh, I I know by the tattoos and the hair and the spikes and and the piercings where that person comes from. Two things Peter had to learn. Two things the church still needs to learn. No one is beyond God's grace. No one. I pray that God fills this church with pierced people, tattooed people, colored haired people. Not just the blue hairs. I'm talking about the red and the pink and the yellow and you know, you've seen them. In fact, if God wouldn't save me, I'd have been one of them. I'd have just progressed out of my hippie movement right into the next movement. And secondly, don't you ever call unclean. Do not ever call unclean. Don't ever call unclean what God has cleansed. Now that person might be working out their salvation with fear and trembling. But the moment they got saved, guess what God called them? Clean. You be careful. Who art thou, O man, who judges another man's servant? Because before his Lord, he stands and he falls. And when he falls, the Lord is even able to make him to stand. Amen? Just like you and me. We're like little babes. No wonder Paul called us babes when we first got saved, needing milk. Uh, you, you go into the nursery today, and Mike and Deanna, it was their turn uh, in, in the nursery, and you will think those kids are demon-possessed. <laughs> now, I'm not kidding you, man. There, there's some weird things going on, and we pray for that all of the time. They're learning how to walk and how to talk. They fall down a lot, and they mess their pants a lot. We used to have that verse over our nursery. They shall not all sleep, but they shall be changed. (laughs) And I can guarantee you that's going on this morning. But one day they'll grow, and they'll walk, and they'll talk, and they'll learn, just like you and me. And they'll become mature. And we should be part of that process. Amen? So be careful that you don't fall into that same tendency that Peter did and every Jewish man did. It's not lawful for me to come to your house. Why isn't it? Well, you're an unclean Gentile. Really? Let me tell you a little. I got, no, I'm out of time. I got an application. Like maybe the Holy Spirit wants to interrupt me. But let me just tell you this. The last church I pastored, we had a seven-month period of time where we didn't have a service that somebody didn't get saved. We'd gone to two services on Sunday morning. We'd gone to a third one Sunday night that was a repeat of the Sunday morning because we couldn't get everybody in the building. We had two midweek services. 
because we couldn't get everybody in the building. God was just moving. And God sent this little black lady to our church. She must have been 110 years old. I'm not kidding you. She caked makeup on. I'm not kidding you. It looked like she put her makeup on with a butter knife. And this is no exaggeration because, you know, it was kind of peeling. Not appealing. It was peeling. (laughs) It was anything but appealing. And just, I mean, cakes of it. And and, and instead of taking showers or bathing, I think she just added more powder. But if you've ever been around somebody, and I pray you never have to be, that, that the body odors are coming through the powder. And then there's a smell of like maybe she needed some Depends. But you know, that lady would never leave the service without coming up and hugging me and getting right in my face with her bad breath. And tell me, Pastor, you're such a blessing. You fed my soul today. Man, I feel closer to heaven because you. I thank God and I pray for you every day. She did that every service. And I will tell you, at first, I didn't like it. And there was something cooking my heart that wasn't right. And when God changed my heart, I will tell you this. Till the day she went to be with Jesus, I looked for that little lady to come up and hug me. Because I saw past the outside. And God showed me her heart. And I looked around. I'm thinking, man, there's a lot of ugly people in here that need her heart. Amen. Let's stand. Worship team, will you come? So we got in, all of us Gentiles. That's good, isn't it? We had our Pentecost just like the Jews did. And then read ahead. We'll be in chapter 11 next week. But let's pray. Father, the things that you've shared with us, the things you've shown us this morning, and not just during the teaching, not as we're just going through the last half of chapter 10 of Acts. And there's a lot to be learned there. But Lord, the things that you shared with us during our worship time when the Holy Spirit was ministering, what we would ask this morning as we ponder these things, that you'd give clarity to it, Lord. The Holy Spirit would just, as we go home and we think this week about the things we've learned, that you would give clarity to that. And not only that, Lord, that you'd give permanency to it. That that would work in our hearts to change us. And I think the two things we take away this morning is number one, to be reminded that nobody is beyond God. That his arm is not short, that he can't save to the uttermost. Whosoever calls upon his name. And then secondly, Lord, we need to be very careful not to call unclean what you have cleansed not to be judgmental or legalistic in any way, shape, or form. And to be accepting, Father, as you are, because you respect no man's person. Help that to sink deep into our hearts this morning, we pray. In the mighty name of Jesus, we ask. And all God's sons and daughters would say, Amen. Amen. Hey, let's worship our God.
As we do that, Father, you have declared us to be holy. Uh, not because of any act of our own, but because of your grace. And we, Lord, we thank you for that. And Lord, may the same thing happen to us this week that happened to Jeremiah when he said that the word of the Lord burns in my heart so that I cannot but speak it. Father, may you answer our prayer if our prayer is, Lord, take me deeper. Cleanse me, wash me. I want to know you in ways I've never known you before. I want you to be ever so real. Speak to me, Lord, like you spoke to the early church in the first century. Lord, I don't need an angel to show up, but the Holy Spirit would be fine. Just speak, Lord, and your servant will listen. And so, Lord, I just pray a blessing upon these people. <coughs> Father, I, I pray, Lord Jesus, that your grace would abound to each and every one of them. That your mercies this week would be new to them every morning. Lord, I pray that you would wrap your loving arms around each and every one of them and just share with them and show them this week how much you care about them. Father, build their faith and confidence in you. Draw them deeper, we pray. In the mighty name of Jesus and all God's sons and daughters, again with a loud voice would say, Amen. 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 Hey, listen, if you need prayer, we'll be right up here to pray with you and for you. If not, you are dismissed the fellowship. Have a great day in the Lord.